Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm here with Rabbi David Mivasir. He's been a progressive Zionist for much of his life, but recently he's had a change in perspective and he's supportive of the Palestinian cause. Rabbi David, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. I really appreciate being able to be here and, and talk with the people. Rabbi, I wanted to ask you about your journey. You know, what you've told me before is that you were a Zionist for much of your life. Yep. And then something shifted in your thinking. So what went through your head and how did you get to that realization that, okay, I want to support the Palestinian people in their fight for peace and justice? Yeah, well, I appreciate the question. <laughs> a hard question. Yeah, I just want to say, I don't think it's such a clear dichotomy between one and the other. And for me, when you say I was a progressive Zionist or a liberal Zionist, what that means is always I've been aware of the plight of the Palestinian people and their oppression and their suffering and what Israel has done to them. And what that means for me is from the very beginning, when I was <clears throat> a teenager and started to get interested and involved with Israel, part of it for me was help the Palestinians, you know, yeah. me participate as a Jewish person in Israel in a way that makes things better for the Palestinians. I saw that from the very beginning. I've always wanted to do something about that, but more recently I've realized it's like incompatible. It's, it's incongruous. You can't have a Jewish state with equality, freedom, safety, justice for Palestinians. It so was there be. a specific event that led to that kind of thinking or was it like over time, you sort of little cognitive shifts that took place that suddenly, boom, you know, your, your mind changed? In my experience, I, I first went to Israel as a 19-year-old American Jew, young man, trying to find my place in the world, coming to a place where I felt like, whoa, you know, like, Israel, that's, that's like my people's country. So the very first week, maybe the second or third day, I was in Jerusalem. I was walking down a street that's called Jaffa Street. It goes from the Jaffa Gate to Jaffa. And there's nice old stone shops and stuff. And there was a little boy, maybe six or seven year old boy, it, it, bleeding from his hand. He must have cut his hand on a broken bottle, bleeding and crying. And, and, and there was two policemen there. So I, I went to the boy and I said, you know, come with me. And I took him to the policeman and I said to the policeman in Hebrew, help, help this boy. And they said to me, what are you talking about? He's an Arab, you know, just get rid of him. So uh, that was my first experience. Uh -huh. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, this is not okay. And I had experience after experience after experience like that for me, I would say 30 or 40 years before for I could like break through the cognitive dissonance between wanting Israel to be a good place mm -hmm. and the way the Jews are running that country be a good thing. I want to believe that. And the facts right before my eyes are the, the opposite. And in my brain, I couldn't like put the two together. Mm -hmm. And you asked me, was there a specific incident so seriously when the the Mavi Marmara, which was a, a ship from Turkey, sailed with six other ships carrying humanitarian aid to Gaza. Seriously, things like school notebooks and pencils and wheelchairs and crutches. And the Israelis attacked them in international waters and and murdered a number of people. But when I saw that, I just thought like, I, like, I can't play this game anymore. I, I, it's like, I just have to like rip off in a way like the mask or the cover that I've been wearing. And in, and in a sense, like having a place at the table didn't serve the goals that I need to serve and I can't self-censor. Mm -hmm. And the very next morning, seriously, the very, very, I mean, that happened at night where I was. And the very next morning, I went out to a huge demonstration in Vancouver where I was living.
I dress the way I'm dressing now, so it's like kind of a, you know, look like a rabbi, not just a guy with a t-shirt and shorts. And I was interviewed like now, and I really spoke like clear. And um, that actually really ended my being tolerated in those circles of things like the Jewish Federation and Sija. You know, they never really like kicked me out until then. But it, for me, it's very liberating. If I have any regrets, it's that I didn't do it sooner. And I just want to say, I think a lot of Jewish people are in that place. Probably everyone in the world wants to think, if they identify with a group of people, whatever it is, Muslims or of course, an anybody, yeah. they're good, and we're doing good things. And if we're not doing good things, it's because, oh, we're making a mistake or we don't quite get it right, but really, we're good, aren't we? You want to believe that, and to kind of give that up, is a, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I can see that it must have been a real emotional struggle for you, it, not just an intellectual struggle, but in, uh, even, even now, now right? Even now, when I think about it, yes. Yes. So how has the mainstream Jewish community responded to you? Yeah, so that's actually really sad. When you say mainstream Jewish community, you're talking about, I'll say, like the world of synagogues and the major Jewish organizations. Each city in Canada has a thing called the Jewish Federation. Mm -hmm. They're all linked by an umbrella group called CJA, which stands for the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Mm -hmm. I am persona non grata, meaning basically like excommunicated. How do you feel about that? It's very hurtful. That's my community. If I want to pray with a group of Jews in a synagogue and hear the Torah read and sing the songs that we sing in our worship, I don't have a place where I can go and be comfortable with that, you know? And it's very sad. And more than my own personal experience is it's very sad for me that the dominant institutions of Jewish people are so like firmly entrenched in this point of view. I feel like they're in such a kind of a defensive position and they won't let go of it, you know, and they're just kind of digging themselves in more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think more and more and more Jewish people like me are realizing this is wrong and leaving it. Mm -hmm. And I hear from them. Okay. I talked at McMaster University last night with an imam, with uh, Sheikh... Ayman Tahir. Right? Sheikh, Sheikh Ayman Tahir. Mm -hmm. There were two Jewish students there. They're both like 18-year-old Jewish people who grew up in Toronto. They came to me and they just told me exactly this. They don't feel comfortable going to the place where they grew up. They feel very isolated. They're very like, kind of, what can we do Jewishly? You know, and... So what did you tell them? What's your advice? To someone oh, in that two, situation. Two things. One, join us. I'm part of an organization called Independent Jewish Voices, which is really focused on justice and equality for Palestinians, and we as Jews being part of that struggle. So Independent Jewish Voices. It's not a religious organization. That's not what we do. But I said to those, there are two young women, you know, just, I said, Come to my house for dinner on Shabbat. You know, like we can be together and that will grow. Mm -hmm. So Rabbi, you, you, you think it's going to grow? Like, I mean, I feel like I'm seeing the protests that are happening. I saw that many Jews were um, protesting at um, in New York at the Central um, Station, yeah. right? Grand Central Station. Yeah. Um, they were also at um, Staten Island, Staten Island. They were protesting there and they've been doing it, you know, I'm sure in many other communities yeah. as well. Um, I have been involved in interfaith work for quite a long time as well. I'm wondering where my Jewish friends are, because to be honest, many of them have not even reached out to me, and they know that my family, my husband's family, is from Gaza, and they're suffering right now. So I'm, I'm wondering how the Jewish community, the mainstream Jewish yeah, community, yeah. is feeling right now. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. You, you expressed and if, that well. And if they are kind of changing their minds, as you're suggesting... It, Right. I think so many individual Jewish people are struggling. 
Okay. A bit like the way I described myself, say, 10 or 15 years ago. You see what's going on. You said, you see these images. And it's so hard to reconcile that with what you want to believe. And it's it's like, um. it's so hard to like tip the balance or cross the threshold and actually say like, no, what Israel's doing is wrong. And I can't support that. I have to do something about that. I would say even more so as a Jewish person with those connections. I have a greater responsibility than other people. I have to do something. To get to that point is so difficult. And you know, just something going through my mind right now, I want to say out loud. So much of what I do is informed by what I know about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And there's so many stories of Jewish people in Germany or in Poland or whatever in the 1930s, early 1940s, they had neighbors, they had colleagues, they had people they would invite over for dinner, people that the, the children went to each other's birthday parties or like, you know, and when the Nazis came and things started getting bad, those people like backed off from them and stopped talking to them. And you know, when their kids weren't allowed to go to school anymore or when a man or possibly a woman who was a doctor wasn't allowed to practice anymore, people didn't come to them and say, oh, I'm so sorry this is happening, how can I support you? So there's a tendency among maybe almost everyone to kind of just go along, to get along, not rock the boat, you know. So not get in trouble, right? Yeah, and, and I think more and more Jewish people are breaking through that. You know, there, I, there are people who might have, there are people I know who experience what I just described, like say, okay, I went to Israel, and the very first week I was there, I saw two policemen like just you know, be so disrespectful to a little boy who was bleeding because he's Palestinian. And I gave up on Israel. I went back home and I never wanted to be there. Hmm. But not me. I stayed, metaphorically, <laughs> I stayed there for 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think everybody has a different tipping point. Everyone has a journey. Yeah. yeah. So, Rabbi, how would, how would, like, let's say me, if I wanted to engage with a member of the Jewish community and and share how I feel and, and, and how I understand what's going on um, between Israel and Gaza right now and, and just generally the Palestinian people. What is the best way to engage with them? Because right now there's a, it, it's very heated, right? It is. And I feel like Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims are concerned that they will be seen as anti-Semitic, right? Um, so how do, what's the best way to interact in this situation? It's really difficult. First, I want to say it's not, it's not only Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians. Many, many, many people who don't have that background have the same dilemma. Don't know how to like engage with people that are feeling very differently. And the same thing is true among Jews, mm -hmm. right? I don't, I don't have a good answer. And, and just acknowledge it's really difficult. And I don't know, I could say all kinds of things. You could probably <laughs> say the same things I could yes, say. I what You know, I could say things like, try, you just said, don't antagonize. Like, maybe just try to listen or, I don't know what. I think s I hear things from other Jewish people and supporters of Israel who aren't Jewish. I just said, I think they're like brainwashed. They're indoctrinated. So much stuff is being said now that is wrong. It's just misinformation, disinformation. It's intentional. There's, an in, there's a massive, I can say like a propaganda machine that's trying to push a certain narrative that more and more people don't accept. People see through it. They know it's not true. But still other people are, are um, caught up in it. Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, actually, no. You know, a settler colonial society that exists because it stole other people's land, destroyed their houses, kicked them out, and it's still doing that continually for more than 75 years, does actually not have a right to defend itself. That doesn't mean that individual people, I'm saying individual Israeli Jews, should not be harmed or God forbid, killed, but the state, actually, I, I don't believe it has a right to defend itself. 
And I'm just using that as an example of something that's kind of common parlance or people just say it. Well, all the it, political leaders have said it well, over all, and over over all the wrong. past and, several and weeks. It, and, it, and it needs to be contradicted. There's so many things like that. All the time you hear claims about Israeli women being raped by members of Hamas. There's never one example, like I can say very confidently, that didn't happen. Even, you know, there have been four hostages released, a mother and daughter, maybe two weeks ago, two elderly women about a week ago. All four of them talk very comfortably and freely about how well-treated they were, they were fed, nobody harassed them. I'm glad you're talking uh, about uh, that because I mean, there's so mainstream many... media is not telling these stories. Not only that, but even in Israel, they have been shut down, you know, and their government is actively contradicting what they say about their own personal experience. Mm-hmm. And there was, there was a woman who survived the attack on Kibbutz Be'eri. I, her first name was Yasmin. I forget her last name. She survived it. And she said, she's the first one who said that the the people around the Jews, the Israeli Jews around her who were killed, were killed by Israeli fire. The Israelis were going to free them from the Hamas fighters and killed them. And she said there was a a Hamas guy like captured her and said to her in Hebrew, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We just want to take you as a hostage. And nobody hurt her. And then she escaped. She said that in Hebrew. It was in the Israeli media. Mm-hmm. I've seen clips of her talking. I understand Hebrew. That's what she said. But the story is how brutal and savage and uncivilized and dangerous and like, you know, civilization needs to defeat them. Yeah, one of the things that is very prevalent is this dehumanization of Palestinians, and in particular, people who live in Gaza. And I know that, Rabbi, you have personal contacts with people in Gaza. Can you speak a little bit about how you've developed those relationships and where they are now? Let me just, I just want to give some background for me. So again, seriously, in my life, I have heard so many people talk about during the Holocaust, they were in a ghetto, they were in a concentration camp, people around them are dying, and people would say, oh, if only someone somewhere in the world knew what was happening to us, you know, or after the camps were liberated, they could find like little little notes written on the wall, yeah. you know, if only someone knew. And I have that in my mind. So it happened that a few years ago, some people in, in Gaza found me on Facebook. I'm pretty public. My my thing is up there. You can see me. You see what I'm posting. And the I thought, sure, I'll answer them. You know, I'll engage with them. I'll have like a human relationship with someone. They're in Gaza. I'm in Canada. I'll connect with them. And there was one man in particular named Rizek. <clears throat> they wrote back and forth, told me about his children, told me about things. At that time, he um, he had had a very good steady job but he lost his job he had a little i'd say a conflict with the government in gaza and and after maybe two or three months of just kind of chatting he actually said to me he's like ashamed to say this but he's having difficulty feeding his children and could i possibly help him and I thought, oh, of course, like, like, of course. And I sent him $50. And he was like, oh, my God, thank you so much. And I'll just say that developed. Other, pe- other people were, like, writing to me. They don't know each other, but I also started feeling like, well, I should answer them and develop, like, just a human relationship with them. Mm-hmm. So, like, I actually started, like, getting people to help. I created a GoFundMe. Yes, I noticed that on right? your Facebook page, yes. I... I I put on my Facebook page, like, whoa, there's this, like people in Gaza need help, and we can get it to them. We can use Western Union. Even now, even this week, I sent $2,000 to somebody by Western Union. It took them 11 days before the Western Union office opened 
because it's getting bombed. The person who needed to open it like got there. They had electricity. They had some cash in the drawer. And this person got to $2,000. We can do that. Uh-huh. You know, so I have relationships now with maybe 10 or 12 people. And I know each of them, are, they're helping people around them. They're not just like hoarding or keeping it for themselves. And they're amazing people. I just want to say I do a lot politically. You know that. I'm like literally in the streets. I was one of the more than 300 Jews who were in the U.S. Capitol and got arrested on October 18th. I, I lobby. I literally go to Ottawa. You know, I do all the political stuff. I don't see a lot of outcomes or results. You know, yes. I have a faith. I mean, I seriously have a faith that everything we do matters. It's all going to add up. One day we'll tip the balance. We need to keep doing all the political work we can. But last time I was in Palestine, I saw people that just, they, they need help. You know, and I thought if I can send $50 and this man can feed his children this week, I got to do that. You know, mm-hmm. so I'm doing. S- that says something about you. You put your money where your mouth is. You well, know, my money like and even more, things. I put other people's money. Exactly. You know, I've, I actually have to keep records so I know what's going on coming in and going out. I, I have raised and sent about $50,000, but I'm, I'm just making a point about something that um, I actually think everybody can do. Mm-hmm. And there's such a need. There's a dire, immediate, specific need. And if you help in that way, there's like absolutely tangible, concrete results. You know it. You know it. Rabbi, I want to ask you, how has your faith motivated you to take action on Palestine? Well, one thing is simply having faith. You know, like... <laughs> Gives you hope, right? <laughs> like, faith, hope. This is not going to go on forever. This whole world is created to be better than it is. You know, mm-hmm. I could say God or whatever made this world be and put humans in it. The intention wasn't for us to live the way we are now. We're on a path toward a better way. And it's a multi-millennial struggle. You know, we can read our prophets that, you know, from 3,000 years ago saying the same things that we could say today. You know, so having faith is one thing. Like, don't give up. Find what you can do and just know that everything is contributing to making a difference. And my specific Jewish faith, I mean, the Jewish religion, it teaches us that what's most important is what we do. It's our deeds, our acts. It's actually not our beliefs. It's a beautiful line in the Torah that I learned when I was a kid. You know, the Bani Israel, you know, the children of Israel are standing in Mount Sinai and hearing, they're hearing God speak. And what they said back to God is they said, Na'asev and nishma, we will do and we will listen. And that's kind of the priority in the Jewish religion. If, if God tells us to do something, do it. And all the philosophy and all the, you know, all the beliefs, we can discuss that later. But there's so much that we need to do in this world. And my faith informs me and... I feel like it just puts like a command on me. I have to do it. You know, God spoke to Moses. God used the word radof. So one of them is tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. And that means justice, justice. You shall pursue. And the other one is bakesh shalom viradfehu. Seek peace and pursue it. So our rabbis in ancient times, like 2,000 years ago, they said every commandment or every mitzvah, you do it when you have the opportunity to do it. But peace and justice, you have to get up out of your place of comfort. You have to go out there and you have to pursue it. And these are things that come from my faith tradition that inform me and gives me strength and enables me to keep going in hard times. Another teaching that I love from a rabbi who lived about 2,000 years ago. He said, Lo ben which means 
It's not your obligation to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. And I understand that to mean maybe like none of us can actually accomplish what we have to do here, but we have to try and do what we can. Mm -hmm. And actually part of that is be who we are, right? Yes. I'm a rabbi. You're a Muslim leader and teacher in some ways, a media person. You do what you can do. I'll do what I can do. And we have to do those things, even if we can't complete the task. If you could give one message to mainstream Jewish leaders, what would you say to them oh my God. right now? In this situation where we're watching things unfold in Gaza and you know, watching in horror, I guess. Well, I would try to say something like, put the ethic before the ethnic. To step back from your rightful and passionate loyalty to Jewish people and Jewish institutions. Step back from that. Just set it aside for a minute and try to look at the situation in a bit of a detached way. See what you see. And then go back into it and think what you can do to make things right. We'll leave it at that, Rabbi. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a very insightful, interesting discussion. I learned so much, and hopefully we'll have you back here again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. We have some exciting news to share with you. As you know, Let the Quran Speak has been on TV screens and social media for 22 years. We've been reaching people all around the world, spreading positivity and good, and helping people experience the beauty of Islam and the accomplishments of Muslims. We've been shooting in this very space for the past two decades. And now, with the help of Allah, we're about to get the keys to Muslim Media Hub. If you like what we're doing, you're going to love Muslim Media Hub even more. Because it's the next step. Up. Think new TV shows, podcasts, social media content, and film. It will have new talent, more youth, and a lot more space and resources to do what we love. Spread the message of Allah. Our Muslim Media Hub costs $2.4 million. And for that, we need to raise $300,000. Please give whatever you can. Every dollar counts. It's our collective responsibility to share the message of Islam with our fellow human beings. Please help establish Muslim Media Hub so we can do this. It's a sadaqa jariya, something that will continue to be of benefit to the Muslim community long after we are gone. Thank you, and may Allah bless you and your loved ones today and always. Assalamu alaikum.